Peters. Care and comfort that surrounds you on FM 98.5 AM 680 WPTF. 60 minutes devoted to giving you all the information you need when caring for a loved one. With Mary Lucas and Jason Kong. If you have questions for the show, you can email agingmatters at transitionslifecare.org. Welcome back to Aging Matters, care and comfort that surrounds you, a service of Transitions Life Care. It's your life, your care on FM 98.5 AM 680, WPTF News Talk Traffic. I am Jason Kong. I am here with Mary Lucas, and we are now going to turn our attention to a conversation on death doulas and to do that we are pleased to welcome charlie hi charlie is the uh is a consultant with final wishes charlie thank you so much for joining us today thank you uh glad to be here so doulas have gained a lot of popularity lately as a non-medical support for those giving birth you know i, I hear a lot of pregnant women talking about their doulas but death doulas are a newer concept for so many so charlie can you talk us through what a death doula is yeah, sure. First of all, let me say that uh, I was not hired by death. Uh, I'm not an agent of death. I don't work for death. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, the, the terminology can sometimes throw people off, and sometimes we use the term uh, end-of-life doula. Mm. Uh, but, but at the same time, we want people to confront the reality of death. And you're so right, as far as women and birth doulas, that's typically been uh, used together. But uh, it's providing non-medical support for people who are facing uh, the end of life. Uh, it can be an awkward journey, uh, especially when you don't have a companion or sometimes family. They get too emotionally involved. And so a doula, a doula comes in and offers uh, non-judgmental support. Mm -hmm. And if I could use this phrase... I call us the triple A of death and dying. That uh, when triple A responds and we've locked ourselves out of the car and we need the keys, we really don't want to be chastised about how did you lock your keys in? This is the third time I've came out this year. <laughs> or if you have a flat tire, you know, you should have had better tires in the first place. We don't want to hear that. So in the same, same mode, uh, a death doula, when we go to support families and those that are dying, we don't do it with a judgmental attitude. We don't try to uh, chastise them about why didn't you have your advanced care directives done. We just go in and fill the holes of that continuum of care in a non-medical way. So whatever hole uh, needs to be filled, a death doula steps in and assists. Now, now with that being said, um, there are a lot of specializations with doulas. So some specialize in elder care where they're going to be uh, mainly dealing with assisted living facilities. Mm -hmm. You have some that, of course, death doula, you're going to think end of life, but some actually uh, emphasize that end of life portion where they're going to be doing respite care. They're going to be mm -hmm. sitting by the bedside of someone who's about to transition. Um, you also have legacy facilitating doulas, and what they'll do is help uh, those who want to build a legacy. Uh, maybe it's a collage, maybe it's leaving some kind of written... Um, written uh, instructions about what life is meant to them and that kind of thing. You have mourning or death, mourning or grief doulas also who specialize in dealing with families who are suffering from grief uh, after the fact that a person has passed. And then post-death home organization doulas. When someone passes and there's a lot of memorabilia, pictures, uh, items left, uh, it's sometimes emotionally difficult mm -hmm. to go ahead and get these things organized and, and out of the way. So you can have a doula come in and help with that process. And then finally, uh, there are pet doulas. A lot of people wouldn't associate right. doulas with the pets, but pets actually, for a lot of families, are, are, are family members. And they can live for over a decade a lot mm -hmm. of times, and they become part of that family unit. So a doula can come in and actually do the same thing that you would do for a human being because there's grief associated with losing that pet also. Oh, you're pulling on my heartstrings. Uh, <laughs> how do you go about finding a death doula that works best for you and your family? Now, that is a great question, and I think it'll be easier in months and years to come as doulas become more associated with mm -hmm. death. Um, there's a death doula directory that you can go to uh, for most states. Now, some states, it's because it's so new, don't even have a list of any doulas listed. But that would be where I would start mm -hmm. in your particular state. 
Um, you can also visit my website, and I can assist in finding a doula uh, in that particular specialization that someone may need. And my website is uh, HighSocietyAfterCare.com, and that's mm -hmm. H-Y societyaftercare.com but hopefully doulas will become more popular deaf doulas and and we'll have more people uh, jumping into this field absolutely are they ex an expensive thing to add on to your care at the end of life well it's going to depend uh, some doulas do it on a voluntary basis because they just have a heart for it mm -hmm. and financially maybe they're, they're doing okay uh, doing well enough not to uh, need to charge for services but mm -hmm. That's something you're going to work out ahead of time, and some may build by the hour, some may build by the actual uh, client. Um, so because, I'm saying that to say, let's say if someone uh, is a, a respite doula and they're providing respite care, giving the family a caregiving break, that could actually uh, add up to quite a bit if the person lives for a significant amount of time if you bill them by the hour. Mm -hmm. So it's going to vary how that doula approaches that. The thing about it, there's no set way that a doula would do it, so you have to consult with that doula ahead of time. Definitely. So being in your role, I'm sure you've had a lot of meaningful conversations with patients and families about their needs and desires to enjoy their final moments. What are some of the most common things you've heard from, from your work? Well, that's a good question. A high side top five is what I'm going to call this, and okay. it may change. And when I say high side, I'm speaking of high society. <laughs> um, it may change the, the, in a few months when I'm asked this question, but um, I hear a lot of times that, let's say, a, a, a spouse loses their the, the, the other one, and they may say, "I wish I would have participated more in the household duties and mm -hmm. chores." In other words, now I'm dealing with grief, but I don't know how to pay the light bill. Uh, I don't know the bank account numbers. Mm -hmm. I just put, it was direct deposit. That I don't know how to get access to this and that. So that was huge as far as uh, spouses. I know with COVID being such a, having such a, a huge impact on our uh, funeral services that a lot of times families weren't able to have a service. And I'm seeing now on the other side, families, uh, in going through even more complicated grief because they did not have a service with mm -hmm. cremation. So, so I would encourage families to have some type of memorial, for what I mean, even mm -hmm. if you have a cremation. Um, another thing that I've heard a lot of, and this is what I hear ahead of time when I, I offer my services as a doula, which include also helping people with living wheels, uh, wheels, uh, estate planning issues, or referring them to an attorney. They'll tell me that. They don't need it because their family gets along fine. Mm -hmm. Everybody agrees on everything until death occurs. And then unpredictable things occur when you have a family member who's been estranged come, comes in and tries to take over uh, that they didn't anticipate. So, again, I would encourage people to go ahead and address these things ahead of time. Um, another huge area is that grief is not something that you complete. And as a doula, we do get into the aftercare of grief uh, when a family has lost a, a uh, close family member. And, you know, the five stages that we commonly hear, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, uh, they think of that as something that you complete. Mm -hmm. And they'll ask me sometimes, is, hey, I'm on what stage am I, and when will I reach the fifth stage acceptance because this grief is, is killing me, and it's year three. And so one of the things I'd like to clear up is it's not something you complete. It's something you learn to live with grief, and you may go through these stages repeatedly and out of order and continuously. So there's no set way to deal with grief. I like to explain that to people because they don't know it until it hits their, their, their family. And if I could sum up the last one for me as far as what I've experienced, as far as uh, me getting the word out, is a lot of families... Uh, uh, well, let's say the obituary. Uh, a lot of times the obituary is written because a person lived a life. They did not want to live that life. So they wish they had lived their life instead of the life that others wanted them to live. So maybe they were an attorney for 30 years, but they went into the field because their mother wanted them to. But they were miserable during that job. So a lot of people who are about to pass will tell me that they wish they had lived their dreams, their passions, instead of the passions that someone else wanted them to live. That's a, a great perspective, and uh, it's, it's something that we, we do need to spend more time thinking about. And, Charlie, we appreciate your time today. He is 
Charlie High, a Final Wishes consultant, and you can f learn more about him online at HighSocietyAfterCare.com, high spelled H-Y, so H-Y Society After Care. Dot com. Charlie, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you.